All right, Todd, I think we're gonna get started here today. Thank you everybody for coming. I'd like to introduce our speaker today, Todd Avery. He is a board member here at the Goodyear County Historical Society. And he is graciously gonna talk about Ted Hall today, a native Red Wing writer. And his book, The Growing with the Grass, I look backwards on your my screen, but he has unpublished chapters or stuff from the book, and he's going to elaborate a little more on how we got these chapters and such. But I'm going to hand it over to Todd here. Todd, you're free to go. All right. Thanks, Paul. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us here um, at a history break with the Goody County Historical Society. Um, I thought it would be kind of interesting to read some works or work by Ted Hall. Ted grew up, was born in Red Wing. Um, his family is, uh, the Hall family was a cornerstone of history in Red Wing. Um, Ted's father was Edward Ned Hall. He was a vice president at Red Wing Advertising Company and you guys, everybody probably remember um, Jostens more than Red Wing Advertising Company, but Red Wing Advertising Company, and I, I believe Ed, Ed, where did Ned himself actually invented the uh, uh, diploma holder. And that's one of the things I think Jostens was interested in when they bought Red Wing Advertising Company. Um, Ted Hall's great or grandfather was O.C. Matson Hall, another prominent Red Wing figure. Um, in the late 1800s, he was a representative from Minnesota who served in Washington. Um, so Ted's got some, some deep roots that, that, that went into Red Wing. Um, Ted, I think from when doing the math, I think Ted was born in 1921. Um, he passed away in 2003. But anyway, my wife, Nora, the, Nora um, wants to, she's, she's with me here. She, Ted was her uncle, and we were lucky enough to get some unpublished works by Ted. And one of the chapters, which I'll be reading shortly, um, is, is called Bullfrog. But it didn't, I don't believe it made it into his book, Growing with the Grass. Um, but it's really interesting as far as a, a kind of a snapshot of Red Wing in the 1920s, especially on the river. Um, the story, I'm going to give you a little bit of segue into the story that Ted and his father spend the day out fishing. A beautiful day, much like today, much too nice to be spent in the house. They were going to go out and catch some sunfish out on the river. Um, they'll, they'll be talk about a houseboat and a boat house. I should draw a distinction. A boathouse is much like you would still see down by the, the harbor in Red Wing, um, Bay Point Park. The rows of boathouses are like floating garages for boats. Those garages sit on barrels. Today they do the same thing. Today they use plastic barrels. Back when this story was written, they used wooden barrels. Um, Ted talks about going out in a launch, fishing with his with his father and talks about a thoroughbred. Thoroughbred was an engine, a marine engine actually made here in Red Wing. And there's some peculiarities about the engine and getting it running, but you have to consider it's probably a 19, 1910, 1920 vintage motor. Um, they talk about Roxy. Roxy Nelson was a figure in Red Wing down in the river, an old river rat. He ran a, a lot of, a dock service. Um, and they also talk about a boat house. A boat house is actually a, a floating boat that has a cabin on it. Um, we still see them down on the river today. And if you, for those of you that have a hit Red Wing history, you remember the Nellie Bly? That's the kind of the vintage boat house that, that we're talking about. So you can kind of get an image of what a boat house of that vintage would look like. Or houseboat, houseboat, not boat, houseboat. 
anyway, without further ado and segue into the story, I'm going to get started reading a chapter called Bullfrog. And you'll understand why they keep calls a chapter Bullfrog towards the end of the story. Bullfrog. Even today I can hear the bumping of that empty barrel as it bounded down the gangway after my father. Just as I touched his heels, he dived into the slimy bay and the barrel slapped in behind him and lay on the surface spinning. That was 20 years ago. I have often felt the helpless feeling that overtook me then. The desire to be away from the scene of calamity and to disown any part of it. That day I stood and screamed, for had I not seen my father slip into his grave as surely as I myself had sealed the coffin? I was not, it was not a scream for him, but a scream for me. I had no father anymore. My daddy drowned it. I was as selfish as fear as there is in this world, a fear for myself, but my daddy did not drown. He came to the surplus, surface, capless, speckled green from the water, but laughing. He maneuvered his way through driftwood and weeds and pulled himself under the boom that floated between the boathouses. Now, here now, he said, hearing my cries and seeing my tears. Ah, oh, now it's a fine thing this world is getting to be when a fellow can't go swimming when he feels like it. He fished his pipe from a pocket, detached the stem, and blew droplets of water from it. Come on, fellow, let's go get our barrel. He commandeered a scow and pulled out to where the barrel floated. My father set the nose to the of the scow against the barrel and nudged it gently into the boom. Now, fella, he said, get out and hold it there while I put this seed back and where it belongs. With little trouble, we flipped the barrel back onto the boom again and rolled it along to the shabbiest of the boathouses. Always remember, my father told me, only a fool will stand in front of a rolling stone. It had never occurred to me that my father was a fool. Our boathouse sagged and was badly in need of additional buoyancy to a corner. But the sun was out and the day was perfect for a trip to Barnes Cut. Barnes Cut was where sunfish were plenty full and there was a grapevine where you could swing out over the water and drop in if you would rather swim than fish. We'll wait until some day when it's raining, my father said, jockeying the barrel into a corner. It would be a crime against the human race to spend a day like this putting barrels under a boathouse. I knew that when that rainy day came, the roof would leak and we would go visit with some other river rats in one of the boathouses whose roof didn't leak. They would tell yarns like about the glorious race when the Red Wing crew beat out the Stillwater crew in a race that nearly bankrupt the whole population of Stillwater, especially the captain of the steamboat who had brought the Still Stillwater crowd down. He had to borrow money to get enough coal to get back up the river. But when my father said that it was a nice day, no matter what we were doing or about to do, we'd stop and enjoy the day. So the day the barrel nearly ran over him was a nice day, and even old Roxy down in the gas float said that it was about as pretty a day for sun fishing as he'd seen for some time. And then he asked my father why it was, it was we never carried enough gas, extra gas for the boat, so we wouldn't have to paddle it down to his float every time we started a trip because I run her to the last teaspoonful, my father replied. I got this one train so she doesn't need gas only for starting. If you babied her, she'd never run by herself. Roxy chuckled and replaced the cap on the gas tank. <laughs> Wish I was going with you, he said. You're too ornery, my father said. You'd scare the fish away. And besides, the engine won't run right when you're around. He sat down facing the stern, set the timer level lever, opened up the priming cup on top of the engine and turned the flywheel slowly until the spark coil buzzed flatly. 
He adjusted the tone to suit his ear, and then he turned the flywheel until the buzzing stopped and poured gas from his little can into the priming cup. The engine wouldn't start the first six or seven tries. Then it fired, boxed back and forth, and finally chose to go forwards. This is the house door. Or finally chose to go backwards. He was going in reverse. Our boat backed out into the river. Cut the timer and cut catch her on the rebound, Roxy shouted. No use babying it, my father called back. Old Roxy, so generous with advice, always raised a welt of stubbornness in my father. And that particular day, he left the boat run backwards until we were a mile and a half up river and around the first bend. When we were out of sight of Roxy's gas float, my, mo my father cut the timer and caught her on the rebound and the engine started going forward. All right, Captain, my father said, take her up the river. Then he took out his pipe, blew through the stem again, and rummaged around in the toolbox until he found a tin of dry tobacco. I, pre I pretended I was a steamboat captain, and when my father sprawled out on the seat up forward, pulled his cap over his eyes and smoked his pipe, that made it even better, because a real steamboat has to make smoke. And the thoroughbred didn't make anything but a lot of fast little bangs and when, and when she was running right. Not many people ever went to barns cut to fish because there was a tree just under the water across the entrance. But when we were about half a block from it, my father would climb across the engine and sit on the stern at the seat beside me. With the bow of the boat raised high, we charged at the submerged tree. The, per the thoroughbred would scrape and shudder as her bow went way high into the air. Shift, my father would call, and we'd scramble almost perpendicularly to the bow of the boat until our weight flopped her down like a teeter-totter. Then she'd slide across into Barnes Cut where all the sunfish lived. My father never owned a fishing pole because he said that people who fished with the same pole all the time were in a rut and didn't know how good it was to go out and borrow a new fishing pole direct from God every time he went fishing. So we used to go up among the willows and pick out a couple of that we figured God could spare. Mostly we always brought them back and stuck them in the sand when we finished and God never seemed to mind. I was always sorry that we couldn't put the sunfish that we caught back too, because I didn't care much for fish. I just liked to catch them. It was a family law that I should catch no more fish than I could eat. So when I caught two or three, one after the other, I would weigh my pleasure against consequence and usually decide to go swimming. A granddaddy cottonwood tree, like the one we had to bump across to get into the cut, leaned out over the pool as though he was trying to see what was keeping his brother down there so long. A grapevine dangled almost to the water. With my fishing pole, I could reach it from the bank and draw it into where I could get a hold of it with my hand. It was a long swing out to where the vine started back. And when I looked down at the water, it gave me a funny little scared feeling. Sometimes it scared me so much that I couldn't let go, and the vine would carry me back toward the bank, but never close enough so I could get on land. I'd have to let go anyway, and sometimes I'd land it in the mud. My father would laugh and call, he who hesitates is lost. By the time I was six, I got so I never looked down at the water, but at the blue hole in the foliage, and always let go right out where the water was deep and cool. My father had a houseboat called the Bullfrog, where he used to spend a lot of time drinking beer and singing with the Bullfrog grain before he married my mother. I never could understand why my father had to be so sad about not being able to go out with the Bullfrogs anymore now that he was married. My mother would drink a glass of beer occasionally, and I knew that she liked to sing because she sang in the choir at the church, 
along with a lot of the other ex bullfrog wives, so I didn't see why he couldn't take her along. Once I asked him about this, and all he would say was that a party either had to be stag or stagnant. And he hoped I would give this a lot of thought before I married. I would laugh because I knew that little boys didn't get married. Only grown up men did, like my father did. So I decided I wanted to be a bullfrog that sang and drank beer like he used to be. So far as I know, that barrel that chased my father off the boom 20 years ago was still sitting in the boathouse waiting to be put under the sagging corner when the river came up high a few years later and carried the boathouse, boat and all, down into the lake. My father came home from a salvage expedition with an armful of faded red boards and a board from one of the seats in the boat. He sawed them up very carefully and we all sat around the fireplace and ate popcorn and sang Old Man River and masses in the cold, cold ground while they burned. My mother threw in a handful of green crystals Grandma Jim had sent for Christmas and the fire stood up and turned a lot of pretty colors. My father stopped singing and looked like he might cry. Only my father never cried because he was a grown up man and a bullfrog. And there we have chapter one from Ted Hall's work. So you see a lot of pictures that we had and some of these came from family photo albums that my, my wife had from her mother, the Hall family. Some of them were pulled from the Good County Historical Society. The picture you see is a picture of Ted, probably when he was in Northern Minnesota with his trusty pipe in his mouth, just like his father. I think we should maybe open up to anybody that have any questions or any comments or be happy to answer anything anybody has to ask. Everyone is unmuted if you want to ask over audio or if you feel, or if you want to speak over chat, that's fine too. We have that open as well. Oh, I've got a question. Yes, Barbara. Um, I, uh, I, I'm a Mallard Island um, fan and um, I was just wondering, not that that has anything to do with my question, but uh, did anybody ever get the boat out of the water? Uh, the, their boat that they, that went after it floated down the river? Yeah. Um, I, I think in the story, Ted alludes that the boat must have been lost because all they brought, all his father brought back was scrap wood. So did, did it sink or you, it's not? Oh, I imagine, you know, in the springtime, who knows, you know. Some of those are lost to the pages of history, I think, that, you know. The, the, the houseboat survived, and the family actually lived on the houseboat. Their little fishing boat, I think, was destroyed. Got it. Well, it was, it, it was, fun, it was fun listening to the story. There's the houseboat, or a houseboat. That's a big, that's pretty big. There's actually some really interesting stories in, in later chapters. They talk about the family, the, the the family actually living in the summer on the houseboat as it floated on the river. And the kids were, the kids became quite avid um, swimmers. I think everybody in the family swam. Um, there's a story about um, Ted's mother baking pies and trading them to the local fishermen for, for fish for supper. Mm -hmm. So just one added um, amusing um, similarity. My grandpa built a raft that we had on Eagle Lake in Ottertail County in the early 50s. And I remember fondly, um, it was made with, with oil, empty oil barrels mm -hmm. and chicken wire around it. And we just had a blast all those years we went swimming. <laughs> That's, it's, fun to, it's fun to have those histories around water, especially in Red Wing, Good County, anyway, a lot of good stories about the river, the rivers, you know, and the few lakes that we have. 
I should I should have noted too that um, Ted was a conservationist, and um, as a young man, he would go to northern Minnesota, um, up near Rainier, um, on the Rainy River. There's a picture of Ted sitting on a, and that should be up on near the Rainy River. And Ted was a friend of um, Ernest Oberholz, and Ernest. If there's anybody that could be said to be credited with um, saving the Boundary Waters canoe area, that Ernest Oberholz would probably be very high on that list. He worked very hard on preserving that area for future generations. This photograph is actually uh, Mallard Island because I recognize it. Yeah, and it. Ted, Ted moved up to Rainy River and was an editor. He, after he, has, he worked out east, he, uh, he wrote for Time Magazine, New York Times, yep. um, NBC News. Um, he said he got sick of the, the pace of out east and uh, he felt a calling back to northern Minnesota. So he moved to Rainier and published a newspaper called the Rainy Lake Gazette. And... Uh, Actually. He actually um, moved a caboose out onto Mallard, uh, one of the islands. And before he left out east, he bought a lobster boat in Maine, drove it up the Hudson River across the Erie Canal, through the Great Lakes, and then had it shipped up to the Rainy River. So he had a lobster, his own <laughs> lobster boat on the Rainy River. Um, um, I, before before the the um, uh, not the caboose um, the, before the, the houseboat and on Mallard well it wasn't on Mallard it was off uh, Mary you'll you'll have to remind me it was Gull Island Barbara which one uh, frigate Friday are you talking right. about on Gull yeah. Island yes yeah so I did a I'm a photojournalist I I did a photo book on frigate Friday. Uh, uh, during one, I mean, I did the research during one week on Mallard uh, two years ago. Um, was really, really sorry to see Frigate Friday uh, leave the island. Yeah, it took water, it took on water, and so Mary Dorr is one of the. You should introduce yourself. He's one of the caretakers at Mallard Island. Knows a lot about it. <laughs> did, did they? Hi. Thank you for your yeah for your presentation. This is fun to hear some more of, of uh, Ted's writings. From his do, do, they actually, do they ever call it, refer to it as Oberd's Island anymore? Um, s some, some people do, yes. Mm -hmm. But for, for uh, the foundation, the Oberholzer Foundation uh, refers to it as, as Mallard Island for programs. It was, rather, uh, it was rather fun. I really didn't know anything about Ober and we were going through my wife, Nora's, um, after her mother passed away, we were going through some family papers and there was a note to Sila Hall, Pfluger, Nora's mother. Mm. And it was a really very personal note of thank you. And it was signed Ober. And I had no mm. idea who Ober was. And oh, wow. I was gonna need to have those, drawing those connections and putting those dots together was, has been really fun. So this was your wife's mother that had had this connection with Ober? Yes, yes, she knew, she. Okay. Yeah, yeah, through Ted, through Ted. Ted had been going up to, up there since he was in, um, um, I imagine high school. Um, I think we uh, even have pictures of him as a young, much younger, much younger person. Um, yes. Helping, helping Ober out. But yes, I, and I think, yeah. I think Sila, my wife's mother, had said that he had met Ober back when they were in Old Frontenac, which would have been in the 1930s. Okay. Yes, I think Kristen just chimed in on the, on the chat about that. <laughs> well, let's see if I can get it, see if I can get my chat. So. Yep, Mulber and Ted met at Old Frontenac, yep. 
the the um, Oberholzer Foundation might be interested in that um, that letter that you have with uh, over. I wish that I wish that I had it now. Realize I believe I'm not even sure where it's at. Yeah, I'd, boy, it'd be some searching to find it. At the time, I had no. I I remember looking at it and remembered the name Ober and um, didn't make the connection. Yeah, I can understand yeah, that. I got chat up. He was a fascinating character, just like Ted Hall. And I've read a lot of his stories. Um, I'm, I'm sure I've read a book about Ted. Or, um, um, and his, his writing was just incredible. He had such a great sense of humor. Oh, my gosh. Um, he was he was a, a really great journalist. Yeah, and I, you know, Maybe there'll be some point in the future where some of this unpublished work will be made available. Um, that's up to my wife and her cousin and how they want to, how they want if they want to make it available. But um, for those that have access to growing with the grass, um, it's really a a fun read. It's a it's a very fun read, and it kind of it kind of gives you a a a look at life and in, as Ted would say, out in the country, you know, <laughs> in the 19, 1930s, 1920s and 30s. <clears throat> Have you ever had an opportunity to be up on uh, Mallard Island? I bet you would value some of the resources that are there. Yes, well, I, 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 my wife and I love taking road trips. Um, uh, I had I am a fan of the Boundary Waters, and I'm a fan of the Rainy River area. Okay, great. Are there any plans to publish? Okay, I'm gonna get one more chat. Let me see. Are there any plans to publish this material? Um, not currently, we don't have any, there's no plans per se to have it published. I'll show you. What I'm reading from uh, my wife's cousin had it had gone through it and um, and bound a copy for us. So I, I do have, and there's what oh 60, 60 some odd pages. Some of it some of it was um, gleaned through and might be included in growing with the grass. There's other stories that. This was like a um, a precursor, you know, some of the stuff that he'd written before he wrote his book, Growing with the Grass. So there's un unpublished works in it, um, unpublished stories. A lot of it is old Frontenac stories. Um, but this one happened to be from Red Wing. Um, I thought it would be, it was easier to find more historic photographs to include with it, um, which kind of brings it more to life. Um, having Roxy pictures of Roxy Nelson down on his gas dock. I, I thought that was kind of fun. Um, pictures of the old boathouses in Red Wing. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm. Everything changes over time. The look of the riverfront has changed. The look of the um, boathouse village is different than it was back then. Um, Certainly, Ted's images of what he grew up with has, has changed with time. And it's kind of nice to be able to look back and, and have a firsthand count of what life might have been ba like back in a, in a day in Old Red Wing. I live in Goodyear County um, near Cannon Falls. And so it was very fun when this popped up uh, because it kind of connects where I live with where I um, I'm privileged to be able to spend time uh, for about a month every summer up there on Mallard. And uh, so I was eager to join in on this. Thank you. Yeah, it's definitely, it's definitely on my bucket list there it is to, um, okay. to get, get up and do some visiting up there. Um, Con contact Beth Waterhouse. She's the executive director. She'd be Marvelous. thrilled. And, and certainly that, um, and now there's some added in, um, inspiration to, go, to um, 
to go through what documents might be left and might be pertinent um, that maybe we make sure they get saved. Hmm. Yeah. Do we have any more questions? Anybody else have any? I'm, I'm really happy everybody had would join joined us today. Um, I'm certainly not the orator that um, <laughs> I could be, but it's fun reading. Like I said, it's fun reading a little page from a story and a day in Red Wing going fishing for sunfish. I imagine it's a day much like today. It's beautiful out today in Red Wing. Um, sun shining, gorgeous temperature. Be a good day for fishing. Oh, we've got another chat. Hold I, on. I, just put, I just put in Beth Waterhouse um, contact information and oh. also the Oberholzer website, which I would certainly encourage anyone who's interested in, in this presentation would enjoy reading the uh, and seeing the photographs on the um, uh, Oberholzer Foundation website. There is also a Mallard Island Facebook page with uh, lots and lots of photographs um, on that Facebook page. Thank you. Well, oh, that's great. Well, yeah, that no certainly one... that certainly was a big part of Ted's life that that um, I, I only had personally, I, I think I met Ted twice and he has a kind of a fun story. He, he loved to bake bread in tin cans. That was mm. his, uh, Ted's bread. And he would come down from Rainier and, and visit with his sister. And I think I had coffee with him a couple of times. And uh, mm. uh, I think I was, a, I think I was bequeathed a loaf of Ted's famous <laughs> can bread, Ted's bread, you know, so. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, and then I hopefully, like I said, the, it certainly is up to my wife and her cousin um, where they want to go with 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 um, making more of this available for anybody that'd be interested in reading the stories because they are they are Tez, Tez writing is is fun to it's fun to read it's mm -hmm. humorous he's got a way with words and it. it I have a hard time putting it down when I start reading it. I just kind of want to sit and finish chapter after chapter. Yeah. Well, if no one else has any comments, thank you guys for coming today. This was a great history break. And thank you for all the questions and stuff you had after the fact. So we're going to end the chat here if no one else has any more questions. Thank you Thanks again. Everybody. Thank Appreciate you so much. Yeah. Yes, carry on. Good fun.